Anyway, thank you all for coming out on this somewhat unpleasant evening. And uh, thanks for everybody who stayed warm at home and joined us on Zoom. Uh, you, you'll be able to ask questions later using the chat function if you're on Zoom. Obviously, if you're in the room, there's no problem. It's, it's a pleasure to introduce Eric Wilton, who's the regional manager for the National Trust. I think he's in charge of everything within reasonable reach of south of the Tyne. He, he might tell you more himself. But the important thing is that it includes Crook Hall. And that's the topic of, of this evening's talk. And the City of Durham Trust is absolutely delighted with its big sister, the National Trust, has taken over this, this property. We were devastated when it closed. It's a really important heritage asset for the city. And it's particularly interesting to see that the Trust has this vision of using it as a gateway to our green heritage as well. This is the 80th year of, of the Trust, our 80th anniversary. It's, it's particularly appropriate that we have a talk about Crook Hall on this occasion. Some of you will have seen the special cards that we had printed. Uh, I don't know where I can point these to, to show anybody. But uh, anyway, we've got some beautifully painted pictures of Brook Hall, painted by one of our members, Angela Tracy, and those are available for sale afterwards, as well as some of our other trust publications. The other reason why it's particularly apt to have someone from the National Trust here on our 80th anniversary is that, of course, the anniversary was the occasion for me to do a bit of historical research. And I've, I've turned up this, this ancient document, which is the original memorandum and articles of association of the City of Durham Preservation Society Limited. That started in 1942. And it's striking to read the, the set of objectives that the City of Durham Preservation Society set for itself when it became the City of Durham Trust in 1966. But the third of our objectives, our original objectives, reads as follows. It's very brief, don't worry. To cooperate and enter into agreements with the National Trust for places of historic interest or natural beauty. So right from the beginning, we were in partnership or trying to get into partnership with the National Trust. And that's embodied here this evening. So without further ado, and when Matthew has finished setting us all up appropriately, I'll hand over to Eric Wilton. Thank you very much indeed. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. That's quite daunting in itself. <clears throat> Thank you very much, John. Uh, lovely intro. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here uh, to talk about Crook Hall Gardens, also uh, Durham City Green Corridor, as we're calling it. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into the history because we're still learning the history of Crook Hall Gardens. I know you know a lot about it already, but it's been around for a thousand years as a medieval hall, and then the Jacobean, and now a Georgian, and a Georgian house. And it's a wonderful grade one listed building that we're taking on. Uh, but the real uh, gem for the city in terms of the, in terms of Quick Hall is the gardens itself. And that's something that we're focusing on uh, in terms of the visitor offer at Quick Hall, but also how that links to the wider green corridor, which I'll talk about. So I'm going to talk about how we kind of started off our journey with Crook Hall Gardens, uh, acquisition, and then through to how we're going to develop it, uh, but also that link to Durham City Green Corridor. So, I mean, it's a beautiful place. It's, it's massively cherished 
within Durham, within the Durham community itself. I think one of the most wonderful things uh, was when we were, I was working with Keith and Maggie to to acquire Quipcall. We worked very closely with Keith and Maggie to make sure that we went through the legal process in the right way. Uh, and it was kind of leaked about this time last year, actually, when the National Trust was buying it. And I thought, and it was on Facebook, but it was, what was really wonderful about that leak was when we were in negotiations. So that wasn't so wonderful because we hadn't bought it yet. But how much passion and people showed and had for Procore, how delighted they were at the thought the National Trust was buying the place. And there wasn't any negative comments around it. We had 70 or 80 posts on Facebook talking about what a wonderful uh, thing that the National Trust was purchasing Procore and saving it for the nation. And that kind of cemented the whole reason for doing it in the first place. And it gave me great confidence that we were on the right path in terms of acquiring Crook Hall. Uh, in and then Crook Hall, where that sits within my portfolio currently, I'm general manager, general manager, not regional manager, not quite yet, maybe in a couple of years. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm general manager for the South of the Time portfolio. So I already look after the Super White House and the Leaves, uh, and the three miles of coastline there. Durham Coast is six miles. We, we own and look after Durham Coast from Seaham to Horden. And then we have 12 miles of North Yorkshire coastline, Saltburn to Filey, that I look after. And then we have properties in North York Moors. So we have Bransdale between Helmsley and Kirby Moorside. We have Bridestones in Dolby Forest. We have Rosewood Topping, as you'll all know. Uh, Scarfwood Moor is another one, locally known as the Sheep Watch. Uh, and then Crook Hall came along. And yeah, it's been an utter, utter delight to be able to take this on and add it to the portfolio. But I will say now, uh, there are changes afoot. Uh, so we are in consultation at the moment uh, for my portfolio uh, with two other uh, portfolios within the Northeast region. So my Yorkshire bit is going to go to Yorkshire and Ormsby, which is quite nice. Uh, so Yorkshire's going back to Yorkshire, rather than being in the northeast portfolio. And I'm going to be taking on Gibside, Washington Old Hall, Pensholm Monument, and adding that to Crook Hall, Durham Coast, and, and Suter Lighthouse. So I think that will be another wonderful portfolio, and a real focus that band across the middle of the northeast, from Gibside through to the Durham Coast, will be linked together as one portfolio. We're really excited about the opportunity that can bring in the future and in the, into the new year and how we deliver those aspects as well. Uh, but back to this. So that's the news part of the press. Uh, so what's wonderful about this place is, is one of the visitors. Uh, two, it's, a, it's an urban site. The National Trust don't have many urban sites. 10 minutes walk from the train station. Park and ride into the into the city. So, in terms of climate action and our, our you know, trying to be green, it gives us great opportunity to promote that out, out off public transport to the site, which is, is fantastic. Uh, and then, and then the opportunity of how we're working with partners to realise the full potential of football gardens and uh, and the green corridor. And that access to nature is really important. So the way we see it is the gardens is a, and the medieval hall is a visitor offer, and we've got the cafe there as well. Uh, we've got uh, garden offer coming on, uh, and I mean the stuff we've done, uh, well, the stuff I've done to some extent would not have been able, we wouldn't have been able to achieve it without the great team that I have around me. So we acquired Crook Hall on the 28th of March. We got it operational, National Trust operational by the 13th of July in 15 weeks, which is unheard of. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so the team would be the great asset of actually getting it up and running, all the compliance stuff that we need to do to get it up and running, all, all making sure it's safe, the visitors come back and enjoy, uh, and making sure we had a, a decent offer there with the cafe and getting that a commercial cafe in place. So that's been, that's been one of the, the greatest achievements we've achieved to, to get 
National Trust doesn't move fast. So to actually be able to do that in 15 weeks is quite astonishing. Uh, and it's been recognized regionally and nationally, which is it's wonderful for me and the team. Uh, and the other element with that is that uh, uh, being able to keep the gardener, Anne, uh, who worked with Keith and Maggie for seven years, and literally with her and 10 volunteers through lockdown, have managed to keep the garden in a reasonable state. So when we were able to, when we wanted to open on the 13th of July, the garden was pretty much ready to go. And it's all the hard work the volunteers and, and Anne had put in to ensure that the garden was in a really good condition. And it was so wonderful going there from acquisition, every time I went there, you see the garden changing and something new appearing uh, and blossoming. And it's a real wonderful uh, visit to all through the year. It's getting a bit tired now though, I must admit, we're closing in a couple of weeks for the winter and it certainly needs it. Uh, the other thing we've been able to do uh, is also we've linked for next year with RHS, uh, garden scheme so RHS members will be able to get free access to the garden as well and it'll be promoted through the RHS garden scheme uh, and yeah we've seen the winter opening hours there so it's uh, we are Friday, Saturday, Sunday, November through to December but what we're hoping to do we're, we're closed through January but we're going to be open from the 11th of February seven days a week right through until the end of um, November. So there's plenty of time for you to come and visit and come and enjoy the space. I'd love to see you there. <clears throat> and then part of setting up the, uh, the property uh, was also making sure it was fit for purpose. And we had some great support. So great support from uh, the Durham City Trust. Uh, uh, great support from our uh, Durham uh, Association, so that's the National Trust Association, uh, and great support from the business communities that we've linked to as well within Durham. And we're able to do some pre-visits before we actually opened. So we got your feedback to, to making sure that it was fit for fit for opening. And that's really helped us. And I, I've been really impressed. What's impressed me the most about coming? I know Durham City reasonably well. When I first started when I first moved up to Durham I moved up from Lee Valley Park I'm from Cornwall originally St Ives in Cornwall and I moved up to work on what was called the Necklace Park project uh, for nine months in 2009 and I was a Necklace Park officer and that Necklace Park I don't know if people remember but it was a project a four-year project and I was there for nine months on it to, to link Finkel Priory through the city around the cathedral and down to Sunderland Bridge and nothing really they spent a lot spent a lot of time scoping it out but nothing really happened it was just the wrong time uh, we went through uh, recession at that time the, the council became a one unitary body so there was lots of going on and Necklace Park kind of faded away and 13 years later it kind of comes back to haunt me with a quick call in the, the green corridor but the fact is, when I left there in September, 2000, September 2009, uh, I was just commenting the other day that there's nothing really changed in that space. It's all there. It's all there to activate. And now there's real momentum in terms of how we could can activate it. So I'm really looking forward to the challenge. So other things we've done over the summer, we've been doing, getting families out, we've been doing some active play stuff. Uh, we've got a field, uh, where we've been putting up some sports equipment, we've got the maze, and the kids and uh, grand, you know, grandchildren and grandparents have been coming through the, through, the year, through the year, and that's been a great offer for them. We're looking to accelerate that a little bit more through next year, so we're looking at, uh, is there an opportunity to outdoor theatre, outdoor cinema, and we're starting to kind of build a really strong program together. So I'm quite excited about what that space has to offer. Uh, we've had other elements. I think we had 10 volunteers when we opened. About 10 volunteers in the last four months. <laughs> Which is astonishing. 
uh, and that's been transformative for both the, for the gardener having the staff to do more in the garden uh, for crafts and activities we've been able to put on over Halloween and the summer that they've really supported for that. We're doing a second-hand bookshop, so we're starting to get some some income coming back to us from the second-hand bookshop, which is all sort of fundraising. Uh, and it's been wonderful. So they're helping us in terms of Mr. Welcome, they're helping us in the garden. We're looking at doing some work with Parkinson's Durham to offer in the in spring walks out into the green garden for the bar of Parkinson's group. We need a couple of our volunteers really train up as walk leaders so we can take groups out into the green corridor and really start get giving people access to the, the green corridor. The access is there, but I think it'd be nice to have guided walks through that from the book hall and really kind of link with, with groups. So that's what we're hoping to do. Other element we did, <clears throat> we uh, before we bought it actually, we had to put in a submission to Heritage Open Days to see if we could get some funding for the new wave. So new wave project was around uh, properties that haven't been part of Heritage Open Days, and they were looking to see, looking to fund opportunities for young people to kind of design what they wanted to see within the heritage space. So we, I think we applied for that in February. Uh, we got the funding and then we bought the property. Uh, thank goodness. <laughs> That's not thinking about what we do again. Uh, and, and we worked with the young, with a cathedral uh, youth group uh, and they wanted to do some yoga sessions and family sports uh, during Heritage Open Day. So we, we, we got the funding, we invested in that. And that was a success. So we, we advertised it and they were booked out. Uh, quite quickly, uh, and we did four sessions in all, and they were really well received. So, I'm really, I'm really kind of building on that. And then the other thing we've done is uh, I know it was in 2009, it was the first Lumiere, and when I was working for the Durham County Council on the Necklace Park project, I was involved in the first Lumiere, and I, I remember sitting in the cloisters in the cathedral, making sure the bats weren't going to be disturbed by the by the installations that they had up there. Uh, and it was really nice to be involved in that. And it's always stuck in my mind that's how wonderful and cultural that event is. So what I wanted to do is make sure that we linked with Lumiere as soon as we could. So I made that contact. We hosted a year out party on the most miserable, heaviest rain uh, you could think of, November the 17th, when we had all that massive rain downpour. The river was nearly overflowing. Uh, it went really well, the evening went really well, and they're coming back to us in January to look at the opportunity of installing an art installation within the gardens for Lumiere next November, which will be, I think, will be a wonderful uh, addition to the Lumiere, and it will be great for the team to be part of that, and us playing our part in terms of creating a wonderful space for people to visit. So, fingers crossed. That the artist likes the space in January and, and we have an installation. So something to look forward to. Uh, and then on to Durham City Green Corridor. So we caught, well, initially, this is the kind of wedge, as we called it. And I had a phone call from Helen, who's not here tonight, who works for our, our innovation partnership team nationally. Uh, and uh, she just sent me an email because we own Ball House Woods or Rainton Park in Valley Gilwood at the top end the purple bit and she just asked uh, do you know anything about this area uh, and that was last was it 18 months ago it was 18 months ago and I was quite happily able to say well actually Helen I know quite a lot about that area because I worked on it for nine months uh, and we started scoping out the opportunity of what how Crook Hall could be that stepping stone into nature. Uh, and that's something that we're exploring in terms of how we design the garden. So you have that kind of formal, lovely formal garden. And then as you get to the pond at Crook Hall, it starts to seep into more wildlife, nature, rich garden as a, as a touch point for people to get, get familiar with what to expect in a wider green space. And, and we're hoping that that will become a real nice stepping stone and a gateway into the Green Corridor. And that's what we'd like to uh, develop. 
a green corridor concept in terms of national trust is a fairly new concept. Uh, so we're nationally, our ambition is by 2030 to develop 20 green corridors. Uh, and we have three of those green corridors in the north currently that we're working on. And Durham is one. Uh, Gateshead Riverside Park is another and Derwent Valley up to Gibbside. So that will be part of my remit as well uh, with Helen. <clears throat> and then we're also working closely in, in Manchester as well with the Manchester Viaduct. Uh, and that links through from the city to Dunham Massey, uh, so which is a quite a, a large area. But there's also projects in Plymouth, Bath, London uh, that, that's being worked on at the moment. So, and that's a kind of a new cohort of people. So the reason Helen and Laura can't be here tonight is, is because they're, they're, they managed to get on to uh, a, uh, a get together with the other Green Corridor uh, team teams around the country. And they're in Birmingham. They've been in Birmingham all day, so they couldn't get back in time, unfortunately. Uh, but it's all around that, that wider network and there's all working together to, to understand what works in different places and how we can learn from that. Uh, and, and the real key thing around Green Corridors is around providing access for people, access to nature, health and well-being, uh, and active travel routes and, and making our cities greener. And, and we want people to come to the city, really enjoy the city and the heritage, but also stay longer and, and explore the wider countryside around us. Uh, so we're, we're confident that this can do that. So things that we're exploring is the, the cycle routes, walking routes. Uh, we've got the, what's wonderful, wow, what's wonderful about this route? You, I'm kind of preaching to the converted here because you already know it and I've already read your your paper on the, the, the green belt and and you know you're of the same mindset in terms of how we should be protecting these places. Uh, we know it's a really important site. We've got a grade two listed viaduct which has been out of use for 60 years or more. Uh, and it's a real, I think there's a real opportunity here to kind of link different parts of the city uh, we've got great linkages into Framwell Bay, you've got Aitley Heads, you've got we're coming in into the city for that route and people are using it already. But wouldn't it be wonderful to look at the opportunity of linking across Belmont Viaduct up to the park and ride so you can actually park and ride into Durham on a bike would be lovely, connecting into Sherburne, into Gilesgate, into West Rainton and giving people a wonderful green corridor that they can access the city through to. Uh, and what's wonderful about this, this one the green space is, it's already nationally recognized as an important pilgrimage route. It's on the Camino Inglés walking route. It's the Northern Saints Trail, which has just been set up. It's the uh, Weardale Way. It's the St Cuspert's Way. Uh, and for me, it's an obvious, thing that we should be doing is looking at what part it plays in terms of the character of the city, the character of the World Heritage Site, how important is it to the setting of the World Heritage Site, on top of all the other elements that we're looking at in terms of how important it is for health and well-being, how important it is, could be for nature, access, those sorts of elements. And I think it's bringing all of that together, that cultural nature, uh, access into one space, I think will be massively enhancing for the city. Uh, and it's got some amazing ecological interest areas already. We've got, you know, we've been linking the Woodland Trust, we've just planted a woodland at uh, Franklin Woodland at the top end, and that's a wonderful site. And every time I go up there, I see people using it, and it's ne right next to the railway, the old railway's Leapside Spur, which you, if that was back in use as a cycleway and walkway, you'd have these wonderful views across the new woodland that's emerging. Uh, and the uh, and then you've got uh, Brassside Ponds with Triple SI. Uh, you've got Franklin Prison, which is a formidable site. So it's how, how we uh, navigate that route through to Finkle Priory. But I think there's 
for me, there's opportunities there in terms of having roots through to Finkel and making that a much more interesting and ecologically interesting and accessible area through to Finkel. But then when you get to Finkel, there's also a fantastic opportunity to look to look at walking routes through Cockenwoods on the other side, down through uh, Morehouse Woods, uh, and back to the city that way through Kippia side. So it would be lovely to link those up. And wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to do the Weirdale Way along the Weir, <laughs> rather than coming up and away from it? So that's something we're exploring. Uh, and I'm really excited about this is the uh, so to help us kind of visualize that we've created a draft artist impression of what that green corridor looks like and the opportunities within that uh, we've successfully uh, appointed a project manager which is Laura uh, who's not here tonight but you'll meet her uh, and she's this is her fifth week. She's learning fast. She's a fantastic uh, asset to have. It's kind of enabled me and Helen to stand back a little bit, which is quite nice. And she's, she's funded both from the National Trust, 50%, and from Durham County Council, 50%. So we've got that buy-in from the council. Uh, and we've got, you know, we've got the, uh, the resource of the National Trust supporting the development of this, but you've also got the resource of the County Council, and they're really keen. And we're linked both from a cultural perspective with Amy Harhoff, and the landscape perspective with uh, uh, Patrickson, um, I can't, oh, just Alan Patrickson, thank you. Uh, and he's been really fantastically supportive. And we're linking with Jed and Sue Mullinger and, and the Rights Away team. And uh, so we're, and we're link linking with Amy Bell. And yeah, there's so many people we're linking with just within DCC. I think that we're building a really strong foundation to hopefully realise the, the potential that, that's there. Uh, and then to help us even more, we've also done some uh, it's called Insights Works. So MHM, which is a Morris, I can't remember the name of the company, it's Morris something McIntyre. Insights, and they've been working with us nationally at urban sites and uh, where we're looking to activate sites for for health and well-being, those sorts of things. And they just they, so we did a engagement service, went out to as many people as we could get it out to via Facebook and other means. They've done uh, uh, vox pops in the marketplace up at Frammel Gate, up at Giles Gate. So, so we had 49 responses from the box pops, which is just a street survey uh, to understand how people, if people know about the space, how they might use it, or how they'd like to use it, those sorts of questions. Uh, <clears throat> and then the Facebook uh, link that went out and thanks for promoting yourselves as well. Uh, we've, I think we've overall 649 responses and all that's come back and they've created a report which we just got last Friday, which gives us some really good data in terms of what people want to see, how they currently use it, how they would want to use it in the future. Uh, so that will help to inform the vision that we're gonna build in the, in the new year. And then <clears throat> I've already talked about the Green Council. Uh, I've already talked about the Green Corridor Project Manager, so that's good. I'm, I'm ahead, of, ahead of the game here, fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> so, so the other other elements that we're aware of as well, we've got the we've got the new development uh, on side gate. So when that comes online, so that will support people being able to get away from offices and into the green space. Uh, people in the city be utilising that green space. Universities utilising that green space. I think there's a lot lot to go out there. There's also opportunities in terms of uh, leveling up bid. We're waiting to hear back whether that's been successful. So I think we hear back just before Christmas. So DCC put the bid in, uh, and that's linking to the riverbanks work. Uh, 
So they're being connected and improvements. If that's successful, then there's going to be investment not only within the Green Corridor as, as in the future as we work north of Footcore, but also uh, the levelling up fund will come in and support uh, improvements and access around the cathedral, the riverbanks there, and down to the race course. Uh, and we're looking at other opportunities around cycle hubs and how we connect connect people through that space by cycle hire. And it's something the National Trust do really well. So I'm really keen to see if we can have a hand in in creating a cycle hub offer, which offers family cycle rides, offers accessible bikes for people, and we have a really really accessible offer to get people out into the green space. Uh, and then, as well as doing all of that stuff, we've identified the key stakeholders that we've all been working with, and this people involved, the ones we've started speaking to. There's also a lot more that I'm sure we are going to be working with in the future. Uh, and we're building this kind of database of people that we're, we're linking with uh, that will enable us to draw funding in to support the development of the Green Corridor. I think there could be some quick wins as we go through the next three years and how we want to develop it. But then the big thing for me is how do we fund uh, Belmont Viaduct if that's the way we can reach out that side. So that's, that's going to be massive infrastructure funding that we need to look at. But I think there's a way. I'm really positive. I'm, there's always a way. There's always a way. Um, so that's it. Thank you. I hope that's helpful. Any are there any questions from the floor? So, so I just repeat it for the zone. Um, it's about the time frame for developing the corridor. Yeah, so we've got three years project manager post in place. And that three years, from my point of view, understanding how projects work, is, is purely we need to set the vision. And that vision needs to be what I'm really keen is that we 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 set the vision with John Kerry Council in terms of what we want to achieve. We then share that vision with the wider communities around it and make sure that fits with what you want to see as well and the communities, uh, all the communities. And then that helps us hone what that vision is actually going to deliver. And then we work towards, if we can get all of that in place and work towards funding for what, how we're going to deliver the green corridor in the future in the three years, I think that's achievable. So I think from having the person in place, getting the vision together, there may be some small project stuff that we can do along the way, some small funding pots that can fix footpaths or do signage or get visitor counters so we can really understand how people are currently using it. And then there could be a, a bigger funding project to do with Belmont Viaduct if we can get that sorted. But there's a lot of hoops to jump through, and I think there's a lot we need to do to broadcast the ambition and the vision so we can get everybody behind that. Because I think, for me, if we get communities, get councillors behind it, then it will happen. Richard? Yes, there must be many, many different ownerships in that area. Are you getting cooperation from all of them? Yeah. The questions about the ownership issues and cooperation. Yeah, not as many as you would think. So there is, so a lot of the area is owned by Durham County Council, but it's part of a county farm. Uh, so all the area, as you walk up Franklin Lane, all the area to the right of Franklin Lane towards the riverbank uh, is owned by Durham County Council as part of County Farm. Uh, so that's quite nice because we can work positively with Durham County Council on that side, and then hopefully the, and the tenant of the, the county farm. Uh, and then as you get on the other side, uh, that's, again, there's one owner there, but 
what I'm hoping to do is that we can build positive relationships. So there's 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 concerns and hurdles to kind of navigate, but I think the only way we're going to do that is by doing having positive consultation, positive conversations with landowners, and and looking at the bigger picture of what the space could provide people. Uh, and seeing it as a real asset for the city and it could be a real asset for those landowners as well. So if there's, you know, if there's instance of antisocial behaviour because no one ever goes to some of these places, but the people that want to do things that they shouldn't be doing go to those places because they're quiet, opening it up could be a, a really good way of suppressing that antisocial behaviour because you have more, more people visiting, it's more accessible and it starts to police itself. Uh, but, but we need to resource that as well. So there needs to be a good range of team in place, both National Trust and Durham. It needs to be part of the Rights Away network, so you've got the Rights Away team looking after it as well. Uh, and that, I'm hoping that will relieve some of the issues that some of the landowners face. There's a lady right at the top. Yeah, so the, everything in the viaduct is owned by Durham County Council. The old railway line, the Leeds line, spur is owned by Durham County Council as well. Yes. So I gather along the east side of the wood points, either side of wood? Yeah. Are not, like, no, they're not, no. Because of the rights of the way on Wood? Yeah. They're not rights away. No, people are still using them. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that has been. <laughs> I, know, I, know the, I know the landowner really well. We're working really closely with him in a really positive way to try and tackle some of the issues that, that he's facing. And we shouldn't, shouldn't underestimate uh, the impact that antisocial behaviour has, especially on communities and remote places where it's difficult to get peace out to. Or, uh, so it's about working positively with landowners to support them in dealing with those issues. That's the way I see it. And then from that becomes a have a positive relationship around looking at access and then and dealing with that as a as a group. I'm not saying it, it may work, but I think that's a better way of dealing with it than just saying we're just going to do this. We're forcing you to have this. I don't think that ever works, but I think if you work in partnership and you collaborate and you talk and you come to a consensus about what could be positive rather than negative, then I think you come up with a better outcome and everyone's bought into it. Yeah. They did. Um, well, there's a comment that there was a much more use of that um, area for walking over COVID as people were walking more. Yeah. And also that people weren't aware whether it was a public right of way, they had access, so on. Yeah, and, that, and that's what we've actually found. When, with the MHM survey and the details that come back on that, is a lot of people don't know where they can walk are afraid to use the, the green corridor because they're not sure what they can do within that space. So I think there's a lot of work for us and DC to actually promote what, what you can do, support some of that access and give people access, that understanding, that knowledge, uh, but also then working with the landowners if we want to open up new, way, new access routes, working with the landowners to say that we could do it in a positive way, which would hopefully relieve the, some of the issues that you're dealing with. Uh, because at the same time over COVID, in the areas that we talked about there, near Malaga, well, people, uh, groups were coming down, they're having fires in the field, they were smashing bottles. And when you've got an equestrian centre, you've got horses coming through there, that's quite a dangerous situation. So if, you're, if they're walking through fields with glass all over. So I think it's about being respectful of and an understanding the issues that landowners are facing and then working with them to come up with the best solutions to hopefully reduce those impacts and also get us where we want to be.
and then there's a gentleman here. So Fleur first. I was thinking of a, a landowner that's recent. I share that I lived by by before, and I've lived there many years, and I've taken the other four all the way along by the railway, all the way past Newton Hall, all the way up to Twinkle, across by the ducks and everything. Um, and now there are fences because the, the landowner there is keen on building. And I know that Cook Hall um, bought that, that field in order to try and protect themselves from what might come behind them. So I'm just hoping that that green belt will be protected the more now that the National Trust is the player there because you have more trust in it. Yeah, so we've. So one of the questions about the issue of, uh, of owners wanting to build on land in the area that you're talking about. Yeah, so there's land. Both sides of Crook Hall, actually. So there's the Hanrow site, which is behind Crook Hall, uh, near the probation office. Yeah. <clears throat> you've got the row there. Uh, so there's that area there, which is owned by Hanrow. We've had conversations with them. And we've also had conversations with the architect acting on behalf of uh, the landowner and the, the people that he's given uh, rights to for development on the area by the uh, old brickwork site and the pond. And we've made it very clearly, clear to both that we would be, well, our, our main objective in, in looking after open space and providing access to places is protecting the green belt. Uh, and the green belt protection is, is, is a strong protection. Uh, so there's not an automatic right to develop in green belt. You have to have special circumstances uh, you have to show that there's a, a need uh, and and you have to meet the special circumstances for developing on a green belt site but our we've both said to Hanro and the architect that we would be robustly uh, challenging any planning uh, uh, what's the word? Any uh, any planning application that uh, suggests lodges on both those sites, because actually, fundamentally, the especially uh, I don't know too much about the Hanlow site because I haven't looked at it uh, closely, but I've looked at the uh, the pond area and the, uh, it's a really important ecological site. Uh, it's got you know kind of. Uh, beginnings of woodland and scrub areas, and you're going into the high forest there, high woods, and that's fantastic for, for warblers. I mean, the, the bird song in there in spring is absolutely phenomenal. So it's, it's, made, it's, it's harder and harder to develop those areas going forward, especially in the planning process, because the other thing that's coming in next year is biodiversity net gain, and there's nothing they could do on those sites that they would be able to, uh, to, to mitigate somewhere else. So the biodiversity net gain that comes in is going to prevent what would be a strong prevention to development as well, as well as the National Trust, as well as uh, uh, residents as well, which are really important to hear your voice within that. Gentlemen, there? First, I just want to say how much more positive it is to hear about the Planning Council of the year ago. Obviously, why that's through that area. Yeah. <laughs> but my question was, was uh, I saw your, um, obviously, you're talking most about gardens and green, green fiber. Um, I saw you sort of mention about um, plans for the house itself. And I was wondering if there's any plans to have the house involved as maybe as a hybrid asset for the local community as well. I know that you had um, mixed response to the accommodation the question you had out there. But Having the hall and stuff, where possibly it's not open, open, open to the public. Are they plans that? I know these wedding, wedding venues. Yeah, so the. Sorry. <coughs> sorry. Stay with the Zoom people. The company yeah. prefers the plan to what, what the council had uh, suggested of having a bypass through there. Um, the question is really about what do you plan to do with the house and whether or not there can be some community um, hiring for activities and so on. Yeah, so we're not doing wedding venues. We're not doing wedding venue there, so that we could count that out straight away. Four parties or bar mitzvahs or christenings or whatever that. So for me, the, the garden is a. We, we changed the name 
from Crook Hall and gardens to Crook Hall gardens purposefully because the gardens is a really special element. The house is really nice and it's a thousand years of history, but a thousand years of people like us living in the house. And that isn't, doesn't bring a lot of stories out. The medieval hall is really special and that is definitely kept for the visitors. The plan for the house is gonna be a holiday asset, which will enable us to uh, provide a place for people to stay uh, and enjoy the city and the green corridor and the heritage assets, but it enables us to draw an income where we can look after a grade one listed building, which is really important. And then the other thing we're doing with the, there's a holiday apartment above the cafe, and we're just refurbishing that through the winter now to be ready for opening in March. And they, that will, the holiday apartment will give a four star offer and the house will give a five star offer. Because when we've spoke, spoke with Visit Durham, Visit County Durham, one of the things they're missing in the city is that higher end offer for people to, to come and stay. So there's a lot of three star accommodation. So just having a different, a different mix of accommodation and the house will be, Sink 13, but we're aiming at families and families coming together in, in a place, in a beautiful place. So they'll have the garden to themselves in the evening. We'll look to get some cycle bikes, electric bikes that they can use in the green corridor and get it out into the green corridor. We'll look, we're, I'm really keen that we promote the likes of Usher, Red Hill, Cathedral, Durham Coast, Weardale, Beamish. I mean, this endless wonderful sites within County Durham that people come and visit. So it would be lovely to get them here for a week or two weeks and they can explore that wider area. Uh, and the Durham coast is a really special place as well. And what, what that, the story of the Durham coast in itself is an amazing story of from dereliction, industrial wasteland to amazing wildlife rich coastline that we've got now in 20 years so we should be promoting that and really you know kind of highlighting this wonderful maglime coastline that we have which is really unique in itself it's we're in my portfolio between south of the type between Suter lighthouse and the lees and durham coast we have 96 percent of the uh magnesium limestone uh, in the country uh which is you know the maritime magnesium limestone which is really special uh geology that kind of brings out the flora and the unique flora that you associate with the coat with that with that geology so we should be shouting about those areas and weirdale as well and the other heritage sites that we have in the in the county and that's what i'm really keen to do thanks uh, just a bit about uh, one of our members, David <coughs> Miller, is instrumental in the reclamation of the Durham Heritage Coast, and um, is a great proponent of developing access to the green belt and providing trails, walking the green belt. And that's something that we're very keen to support as a trust as well. I hope David's watching us on Zoom from Sweden, where he lives at the moment. Um, I was very pleased with your emphasis on partnership. It's, it's a philosophy that the trust shares. And I was very struck by that screen with all the logos on it. And I'd love to see the City of Durham Trust logo. It is on there, is it not? Yes, it is. It is. We've, we've added it. We've added it. It is. All right. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. Botanic Garden, the University Botanic Garden, is an RHS partner garden. Um, first of all, there was uh, praise for the work that David Miller did on um, renovating the, the 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 coast from the all the effects of the coal, and his interest in developing lots of uh, trails in the area. Um, that partnership and whether you're making partnerships with the gardens, other gardens in the city? We haven't yet. We've been really busy and head down getting this sorted. But it is, my, my intention will be, we will do. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really important. And those uh, 
the sites are really unique in themselves. So I think it's important that we we emphasize the full offer that the city has. And we know ourselves that and we've we've limited the visit to Crookmore Gardens. So we've limited to National Trust members and visitors the three hour visit if they come by car uh, to the gardens themselves, because we feel that's probably enough to enjoy the gardens. But there's no reason why we shouldn't be promoting the other spaces they can go to while they're in the city as well. So yeah, I'll be definitely keen to do that. Were there any questions? Would you know, Matthew, whether there's any questions on? I don't think there's no extras. Just we went to to. Oh, sorry. Anne and I and Andrew Hills are here with our friends of Peel Wood. Oh, excellent. Um, the Local nature reserve. Wonderful. Yeah, definitely. That would help me. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I think that group of people woods that's recently been made a local uh, nature reserve, and people wanted to be here from the friends of Keep Your Woods, and how you can be partnerships with uh, people like those. Yeah, we've got now we've got law in place, which makes a massive difference. So me and Helen, while doing our normal jobs, have done a massive amount in just linking to as many people as we can. Yeah, but we know that's just the tip of the iceberg. So we're really keen now that we've got the project manager in post and it's full time post that Laura will be making those contacts. Or if you contact us, then I'll put you in touch with Laura uh, and we'll be delighted to work with you. And definitely friends of Kippy Woods and, and Peelor Woods will be, I think it's really important. I think that's one of the special things. Uh, I mean, we work in the Sea Mullinger anyway, and we've got the, the Woodland Revival project within the city boundaries. And we're part of that. We've been working with uh, with that team. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name. Professor Rachel Penn, is it? Uh, Woodland Trust. Uh, yeah. So we're we're working with them. They're doing a, a survey uh, of Malligill and Rainton Parkwood for us next year, and we're going to use that to create a woodland plan, a woodland management plan for those sites as well. So it would be really, and that's, I think, the ancient woodland around the city is just phenomenal. It's just wonderful. The riverside itself is phenomenal. So the more that we can interconnect those spaces and connect people into them, it would be, I think it's a, it's a great asset. Someone on Zoom wanting Laura's contact details. <laughs> I haven't got them here, but I will send them to John. John's got them, uh, so we can send out to the people that have attended. I'm happy for you to pass those details on to her email address. Could we send it to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're here to do. Make it as easy as possible for her to connect with people is the is the best way, definitely. <laughs> And we can't iterate often enough how happy and delighted we are that the National Trust has taken over Crook Hall and the gardens and developing in the way. And for us, I think the Green Corridor development is, is the icing on the cake. And you're pushing at, um, shall I say, an open gate? Yeah, or an <laughs> open side gate. Yeah, an open side <laughs> um, You mentioned uh, the necklace park yeah. that you worked on well that, that that sort of had a a second uh, a second visitation in in the neighborhood plan we have a policy for the Edmund network yeah. that really our, our attempt to try and 
uh, develop that idea further. There's there's lots of other sort of you've mentioned the various ways that various people have tried to develop this kind of a, approach. There was something that the Green Belt did. Um, it was I've forgotten the the um, the Durham. Right. Uh, the, the Friends of the Green Belt and the, um, the 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 conference that they had, where it was about wanting to take um, develop the benefits of the Green Belt and to talk about developing a trail around the whole of the Green Belt that surrounds the Durham city. city. Yeah. So I mean, what you're talking about is part of that yeah. process of achieving that. And, and I'm sure when you have the results from the survey, you're going to have lots of very positive responses and lots of very positive suggestions about how you can achieve what you're yeah. doing. And to say thank you for a really inspiring, interesting talk and your enthusiasm for this project and for Crook Hall is absolutely great. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.